Neil Gaiman once wrote, a philosopher once asked, are we human because we gaze at the stars? Or do we gaze at them because we are human? Pointless, really. Do the stars gaze back? Now that's a question. There's a huge amount of evidence that UFOs exist. For more than 70 years, our secret military agencies have been investigating UFOs. And up until recently, the United States denied these UFOs existed and openly mocked and with other means intimidated people who stated publicly that they witnessed these UFOs, who said they saw the occupants of these UFOs, and those who stated on the record that they were abducted by these UFOs. I have had first-hand gnosis to what these people were referring. In 2017, everything changed. When the Pentagon finally released information in the New York Times stating that UFOs exist. And this information included videos of US Navy jets pursuing UFOs. But these videos weren't exactly videos of UFOs landing on the White House lawn. And the government in a brilliant psyops move, change the name of these objects from UFOs to UAPs, Unidentified Aerial Phenomena. John Lester of the Newark Star Ledger wrote in 1958, the numerous signs of extraterrestrial presence on our planet are summarily dismissed or suppressed by every governmental authority of any size or importance, unquote. Nigel Kerner, author of Gray Aliens and the Harvesting of Souls, adds, quote, it is apparent from my research that the intelligence of these visitors is so supreme, they have control of all the governments. Ah. Woo! <laughs> Thank you for the confirmation of any significance on this planet through, con through cartels of their agents at the center of most administrations, unquote. What were the Gnostics referring to in their stories about the Archons? First, we should ask, what are the stories of our lives? We are learning more and more how human beings have a profound need to create and weave stories. Each one of us here if asked, can tell their autobiography, all neatly arranged in a sequential order of events and people who had such and such effect on our lives and how one event in our lives led to another event. The book here is my birth father's autobiography. In short, we always tell a story when asked the question, tell me about your life. Some people's stories here are tragic. Some are success stories. Some are stories of great courage and so forth. Please understand, I am not implying these things did not happen in your lives but I'm sure we have only a very few people here who when asked the story of their life would reply the sound of one hand clapping. Yeshua the Nazarene taught 
profound spiritual truths through his parables. I studied Sufism for more than three decades. And Sufis love to tell very funny stories that illustrate a moral or spiritual lesson. In fact, my magnum opus, a book that took me over 10 years to write, that I titled, The Sun at Midnight, The Revealed Mysteries of the Alibayt Sufis, has within it a book within a book titled, Tales from Under the Overpass. In this book, I update Sufi tales that I heard from the lips of Sufi masters in various Sufi orders in remote parts of the world. Is there really a world around us or is the world itself a story? The story of the story of Truman in the Truman Show reveals that the world is a story. The same goes for Greg, living in the ugly world in the movie Bliss. As human beings, we have an infinite creative ability that we receive from the unknowable one, the God above God. We have yet to fully plumb the depths of this great gift. Nevertheless, we know that our creative imaginations are so powerful that we can and maybe at all times are projecting our imaginations out onto the big silver screen of what we call the real world. So then, what are the archons? I would say that they could be one of the following. Mind parasites, a contagious psycho-spiritual disease of the soul, interdimensional droids appearing human, or insectoid evil entities. All these explanations work, in my opinion, for as Nietzsche said, quote, there are no facts, only interpretations, unquote. For we know that mythology or story is of great importance in helping us to learn about the world and to navigate ourselves through daily life. It is a tragedy that real high quality myths have all but disappeared from society. Words have lost their meaning. In the Gospel of Philip, Brantingham translation, we read, quote, words and names are a source of confusion. They turn us from the real to the unreal. He who hears the word God does not perceive what actually exists, but only an image or shadow of what does not exist. These words are masks, simulations, facades of their true reality and veracity in eternity, unquote. Sadly, corporations like Disney have watered down all the great fairy tale stories taking away the scary parts, thinking that we must shield our children and young ones from anything scary. This is a great mistake. Extraterrestrials too can be scary. We must be prepared to face them. And we should have been taught as children to face these evil dragons when we were children. Where do we find references to extraterrestrial archons in the Nag Hammadi codices? You will find the Greek loan word drakon in the Apocryphon of John, translated as, quote, 
in the form of a lion-faced serpent. Literally in Greek, the word drakon translates to, quote, serpent, dragon, or giant sea monster, unquote. The root of the Greek word means to see and suggests that the literal meaning of drakon was, quote, the one with a deadly glance, unquote. This connects with reports of alien abductees who, during their abduction, relate that aliens will draw close to them, staring them directly in the eyes, which results in the human feeling inexplicably exaggerated emotional reactions that span everything from intense fear to euphoria. In his second book, The Threat, David Jacobs, an historian at Temple University, writes, quote, the mental procedures were even more baffling. Aliens almost always stared into an abductee's eyes at a distance of a few inches or less and seemed thereby to elicit love, fear, or anger. Some of these mind scan procedures could provoke intense sexual arousal in both men and women. By staring into people's eyes, the beings could cause them to see prearranged scenarios and movies in their minds, unquote. In the past, any monstrous sea creature was referred to as Cetus. According to mythology, Perseus slew Cetus to save Andromeda from being sacrificed to it. The term cetacean for whale derives from Cetus. This image of black whale directly reminds me of Yaqui Indian sorcerer Don Juan Matus from Sonora, Mexico's description of the black shadows or the flyers. Carlos Castaneda called them fat black fish, enormous fish. Pertinent to this conference, the name of the constellation Cetus also derives from this word. Cetus was placed in the stars as a reminder of Perseus's bravery, but also to warn people against anger and jealousy. In the Ophite and Sethian systems, which have many affinities with the teachings of Valentinus, the making of the world is ascribed to a company of seven archons. They are commonly depicted as theriomorphic. In the hypostasis of the archons, also known as the reality of the rulers, we come across another Greek loan word, hule, that Bentley Layton translates as, quote, a product in matter, like an aborted fetus, unquote. The text goes on to say that, quote, it assumed a plastic form molded out of shadow, unquote. Words like lion-faced serpent, molded out of shadow, and aborted fetus were probably the best terminology that the Gnostics had at their disposal to describe never-before-seen extraterrestrial beings. However, I have one more definition of Archon that you might not have considered. Is the dragon the reptilian alien? In re reality, the reptilian that dwells in all humanity. I'm speaking about what is commonly called, okay, if we can, whoops. Yeah, I'll come back. Yeah. The lizard brain or limbic brain 
the most ancient part of our human brain. This lizard or reptilian brain is in charge of fight, flight, feeding, fear, freezing up, and fornication. The limbic system is much more powerful than we humans credit it to be. Were the Gnostics warning us about the dangers of being prisoners in our own skulls and not being prisoners on the earth? How would the Gnostics have access to such metaphysical information? You could call the Gnostics visionaries, shamans, esotericists, clairvoyants, mystics, and psychonauts. Through the use of breathing techniques, chanting, entheogens, sacred dance, drumming, sexual ecstasy, and practices taught by Rudolf Steiner. In his many books, the Gnostics perceived the spiritual world around them and made contact with Sophia, the Christos, the divine Seth, Eleleth, and the great invisible spirit. Remember why you were originally attracted to Gnosticism. It was probably because you learned that Gnosticism was a means to make contact, to have direct experience, gnosis, with the divine. I think too many people have become lost due to our Kantic influence in a type of intellectual analysis of what they originally realized was a way to know the mother, father, God. Many people make a great deal about the dating of the Nag Hammadi codices, when in reality, the sacred wisdom contained in the NHC goes back thousands of years as an oral tradition before it was written down and burned in the library of Alexandria and buried in the sands of Egypt. People tend to forget that almost every culture and spiritual tradition on earth began as an oral tradition. Wikipedia states, quote, Oral tradition, no, well, oral tradition or oral lore is a form of human communication wherein knowledge, art, ideas, and cultural material is received, perceived, and transmitted orally from one generation to another. The, tr the transmission is through speech or song and may include folk tales, ballads, chants, prose, or verses, unquote. We speculate a great deal about what was taught in the mystery schools. I put forth a theory that what was experienced in the mystery schools was some kind of encounter with the reality of extraterrestrial beings, either through direct physical meeting or through clairvoyance. The Gnostic initiates were taught by beings from Mercury and Venus. The Gnostic initiates discovered the fact of alien presence on all the planets of our solar system and that our planet is under attack by at least one species of alien. Paul Hellyer, Canada's ex-defense minister, has declared that there might be as many as 80 
alien species visiting the earth. A former head of Israel's military space program claims that extraterrestrials have made contact in the United States and Israel over the years, but the aliens won't come out in public because they worry people will panic. Quote, humanity isn't ready, Professor and retired Israeli General Chaim Eshed said during an interview with the Hebrew language paper Yediat Aharonot. Eshed told the paper that aliens are already present among us here on Earth. How do the alien parasites begin their attacks on humanity? They be, ah, oh, there's, there's Chaim Eshed. They begin by invading the minds of individuals in authority. The almost total dismissal of alien parasites on this earth by the US government and scientists reveals that a counterintelligence agenda is in place designed to keep information from the public. Jacques La Carrière, a scholarly researcher, suggests that Gnostics detected the presence of the archons in all authoritarian structures and systems that deny authenticity and self-determination to the individual. Furthermore, D. Finney in the book, The Archon states, quote, in the Gnostic view of human society, the Archons are alien forces that act through authoritarian systems, including belief systems in ways that cause human beings to turn against their innate potential and violate the symbiosis of nature, unquote. The alien scenario is being overlooked in many ways. In my book, Alien Parasites, 40 Gnostic Truths to Defeat the Archon Invasion, I urge people to choose the authentic over the inauthentic. Don't purchase objects that are cheap facades of the real thing. It is better to save your money and buy one authentic object made by a craftsperson or rural artisan. For example, a handwoven carpet, pottery, tapestry, wood carvings, and sculpture, than to have dozens of inauthentic copies all over your home. How do we defend ourselves from our contact attack? I have given 40 methods in my book. I want to say these 40 methods are not just ways to defend yourself from the archons, but the majority are ways to make direct contact, to have a direct experience of the divine, the God above God. Today, I will mention additional effective methods. First, a very effective method to fight the archons and simultaneously to attain gnosis is known by the name Wuxin in China and Mushin in Japan. Wuxin is achieved through what's called Chan meditation. And Chan was from China and as it migrated to Japan, it became Zen. Wuxin is defined as, quote, the mind without mind, unquote. A state when your brain is not preoccupied with anything else other than the specific activity you are performing at a certain moment. Right now, you are sitting. Be aware that you are seated. 
Now, listen, you must become invisible, letting the true divine light pass through you in order to attain gnosis. Please, I invite you to go to my podcast, Lawrence Gallian's The Silence of the Mind, to learn all about how to use these powerful techniques. Ceasing our human habit of constantly thinking about the past or future frustrates the archons no end because they want to manipulate your thoughts and feelings. And if you silence the monkey mind chatter that goes on in your head, then the archons have nothing to work with. Ask yourself, who's doing the talking inside my head? Would you like to be stuck in an elevator with someone who is like your mental chatter? Osho said, quote, once a person is in a state of no mind, nothing can distract them from their being. There is no power bigger than the power of no mind. No harm can be done to such an individual. Robert Adams says the highest teaching in the world is silence. There is nothing higher than this. Second, all forms of spiritual practice designed to raise kundalini will generate powerful protective energy against the attack of alien parasites. In Hinduism, kundalini is a form of divine feminine energy located and coiled at the base of your spine. Kundalini is known to be a force or power associated with the formless aspect of the goddess. Here we find a connection between the two goddesses, Sophia and Kundalini, as well as the goddess of the greatest chaos magician, Austin Osman Spare, whom he named Kia. Could the Kundalini power be another term for what Yeshua the Nazarene often referred to as living water? or the water of light? In the Gospel of Thomas, translated by Stephen Patterson and Marvin Meyer, we read, quote, whoever drinks from my mouth will become like me. I myself shall become that person and the hidden things will be revealed to him, unquote. I have seen Sufi masters, some Sufi masters, transmitting their gnosis through their saliva via a kiss on the mouth of the student who is ready for self-transcendence. Finally, Finally, I don't know where. Well, anyway, finally, Gurdjieff's methods of self-observation and self-remembrance are tremendously important, potent ways to wake up and realize how we are manipulated physically, mentally, and emotionally by the archons. Only by beginning to remember oneself does a person begin to awaken, stated Gurdjieff. There is one earth, and the earth is good but the human being will see it as a heaven or hell. I maintain that the Gnostics did not reject 
the natural world, but rather sought to save us from the warped perception of the earth caused by the archontic invasion of our minds. Richard Smith, in the afterword to the Nag Hammadi Library in English, wrote, quote, Philip K. Dick developed the idea that humans live in a two-dimensional hologram, part of which is genuinely real, and part of which is the deceptive projection of an alien mentality that distorts our humanity, unquote. Stefan Heller writes in the Gnostic Jung, quote, like Jung, the Gnostics did not necessarily reject the actual earth itself, which they recognized as a screen upon which the demiurge of the mind projects his deceptive system. To the extent that we find a condemnation of the world in Gnostic writings, the term used is inevitably cosmos or this eon, and never the word gay, meaning earth, which they regarded as neutral, if not outright good." Unquote. I want to speak with you about the holy breath. If you inhale the holy breath into your being, flowing into your eyes, everything looks beautiful, even a junkyard. If you lack the holy breath, everything looks ugly, even a rose. The Sufis make extensive use of the holy breath in their ceremony named Zikrullah. And I spent many years learning all these various breathing techniques. And when a person passes on, in Sufism, we do not say he or she died. We say they stopped their breathing practices. Now, I am available afterwards for if anybody wants to hear, hear this, I will demonstrate for you or learn some of this. In ancient Hebrew, Koine Greek, Latin and all the derivative languages, as well as Old German, Old English, there is no distinction between spirit and breath as there is in modern languages. This is because there was no such distinction in the minds of the ancients. For example, the English word was coined by the Catholic Church from the Latin word spiritus, which meant Breath. Maybe you've heard the term Holy Ghost. Ghost came from the German word Geist, which also meant breath. Your breath is sacred. Begin with some form of breath praxis, similar to the breath work invented by Wilhelm Reich. The goal is to see the divine in everything with divine eyes. Know the holy breath and you will have gnosis. Ignore your breath and you will live a hellish existence. Can we move on here? Ah, there's the holy breath. Archons can project their thoughts telepathically and manipulate us physically through psychokinesis. At this point in time, after innumerable scientific studies, there is no doubt that extrasensory perception exists. I personally met a remote viewer from Russia who was living at, in Israel at the time I met her. She was up in Haifa. She had been offered a job 
paying over several million dollars by some European country. But she told me that they wanted her to do something evil. And so she declined their offer. And so she went about, she had a child, a daughter. She went about working oh, many hours every day. And she could have been a multimillionaire. Psionic powers can make you believe you are seeing and experiencing something very real. Archons live in hive-like structures near the planet Saturn. In the book Archons, Hidden Rulers Through the Ages, we read, quote, the representation of Saturn in astrology fits the bill perfectly. Saturn is the planet of death, restriction, authority, control, obedience, poverty, fear, and time. It rules the bones of the body, unquote. Some occultists say that the archons created the bones, the skeleton of the human body in a previous incarnation of the earth in the distant past. Just like human beings, the planet Earth also undergoes incarnations. Others say that once upon a time, Saturn was actually a sun. Okay, let's get a little personal now. I have seen two UFOs simultaneously. I couldn't find a photo of two, so that's the best we can do. In the presence of a witness on a beach at night on Long Island, New York, they were enormous globular-like structures that continuously changed color and came right up onto the beach, no more than 40 feet from me. My girlfriend at that time, the witness, bolted to my car, locked all the doors, leaving me all alone with these two giant UFOs looking at me. And that's the sensation I received. They seemed like two eyeballs carefully observing me. I have practiced shamanism with only a drum to guide me into the spirit world. With someone who studied and completed his studies in the Michael Harner shamanic method. And I have also utilized plant allies, sacred mushrooms and mescaline. I remember once, long before I even heard the word Gnosticism, I had taken some sacred psychoactive mushrooms. For untold centuries, in Mexico, the Middle East, South America, the Celtic lands, Mongolia, and elsewhere, Gnostic shamanic adepts understood that ingesting psychoactive plants cactuses, and by combining certain parts of trees and vines, facilitated connection to the epinoia, the luminous wisdom of the earth itself. Immediately after taking the mushrooms, I saw what appeared to be an x-ray of my head. Inside my skull, I saw an extraterrestrial. This being boldly and coldly said to me, you just think you exist. I exist. I have programmed you with memories to make you believe you have had a history and a story to your life. While in reality, I only use you as a kind of vehicle to help me move from one place to another. I was horrified. At the time of this encounter, the internet was just starting up. Because I worked as a full-time administrator for a university, 
I was one of the first to have an email address account. And I belong to a news group of academics dedicated to discussing paranormal subjects. After my shamanic experience with the alien in my head, I had to ask the group about this. Of course, they all approached the subject from an academic point of view. To be fair to the group, anything weird back then had a huge stigma attached to it. There was one person, though, I am sure he was a tenured or retired professor and no longer had to play by the rules of academia, who was very kind to me. He wrote to the group, chided them for dismissing my experience, and told me what I had experienced was very important. He said that I was not crazy and that I needed to investigate something called Gnosticism. Shortly thereafter, at a pagan festival, I found my first copy of the NHC in a bookseller's stand, and I bought it immediately. How could such bizarre beings as alien parasites come into existence? I subscribe to the teachings that Sophia attempted to create a similitude of the pleroma, she had a vision. She imagined a being that could contain the entire pleroma within itself, a kind of mirror reflection of the ultimate reality. Remember the guy who said, the realm of God is inside you? He was helping us to recall who we really are. In other words, each of you who are sitting here, if you could but allow yourself to acknowledge it, to feel it, cannot be anything other but divine. To truly know this will blow your mind. It will amaze you. However, you do not just contain a spark of divinity. You are not just temples of the Holy Spirit. You are source. You are spirit. You are Sophia's vision. In the corporeal version of the myth, Sophia descended from the galactic center, the home of the Pleroma. Interestingly, the galactic center was a very sacred place to the Mayans. They called it Hunab who, the place of the gods. The energy was enormous as it flowed directly from the galactic center. When the electromagnetic flow of non-organic substances approached, this contact formed creatures similar to cyborgs. Let's be clear. We do not understand space-time. Now, in the Lurianic Kabbalah and Hermetic Kabbalah, these beings are called glyphoth. This means shards or fragments of broken vessels. In Sufism, these beings are known as jinn. And in Gnosticism, we know these beings as archons. There are also incorporeal versions of the story of the creation of the Archons. Whether these mind parasites are corporeal or incorporeal, don't doubt it for a second. The Archons use us like we use cattle. In the secret book of John, Maya translation, we find, quote, the one is illimitable since there is nothing before it to limit it. Eternal since it exists eternally. 
The one is the immeasurable light, pure, holy, immaculate. What should I tell you about it? Its eternal realm is incorruptible, unquote. We know that the mother-father monad, also known as Bithos, Arche, the Gnostic light in extension of the dodecahedron, are all names to denote the ultimate reality, the totality of all things. Perfect, the source of all being, the infinite one. As the monad is the infinite totality of the all, how can the monad be divided against itself? How can there be room for corruptibility if it is incorruptible? How can there be room for impurity if it is pure, holy, and immaculate? In other words, how can evil exist? How can the demiurge and archons exist? How can bad things happen? It defies logic. Perfection is already accomplished. Everything is done as it shall be done. Generally speaking, all of us here are willing to, okay, are willing to suffer, to improve ourselves. And I say that ultimately we are willing, whether we are aware of it or not, to suffer, to perfect ourselves from such basic things as just get, getting out of bed in the morning, to go to work, to painfully lifting weights to strengthen our bodies, and even risking our very lives to save someone in mortal danger, we demonstrate that hidden in pain is something good. We have no idea about the exalted wisdom of source. We are just the tip of the iceberg, as Miguel says. Perhaps it is true that reincarnation does exist. And for example, the deep-pocketed affluent millionaires who hoard their money must experience starvation in another lifetime. Simply put, the Gnostics made it abundantly clear that the one is ineffable. We need humility when it comes to believing that we can make any kind of definitive statement about the God above God. However, while unfortunately the details are very scant, the Gnostics more than hinted that by using various prayers and rituals, we can develop a direct connection with the divine Seth, Yeshua the Nazarene, Sophia, Barbalo, Ortogenes, and so on. And that finally, we can know ourselves. Stop dissecting the Gnostic gods and goddesses as if they were dried out and brittle pages of the original NHC. The divine Seth, Yeshua the Nazarene, Sophia, Barbalo, Ortogenes, etc. are alive and waiting for you to reach out to them. At night, we are constantly creating stories that we call dreams. When we are dreaming, we believe the dream is real. Gurdjieff and Uspensky stated, we live our days in sleep. It seems we human beings just cannot live without some kind of story. For thousands of years, stories were told around the various campfires in every cave, tribal gathering, and feasting hall on the face of the earth. So where does all this horror come from that we see taking place on the earth? Are we not capable of creating all kinds of stories? We play with horror. I'm sure there are more than several people here 
who love Clive Barker and Stephen King. In other words, we adore the creative work of authors who have created all sorts of hells, hating angels. That's a quote from Miguel. And the grossest and most horrible things ever. While we don't always have the ability to, while we always have the ability to create our reality, we don't always use our creative ability wisely. As a matter of fact, we human beings frequently are completely out of control when it comes to our creative making abilities. We are like Q in Star Trek The Next Generation. In other words, we are adolescent gods who are learning to control and use wisely our creative power. Amazingly, there exist magicians. This ties in with Miguel's talk, who are involved with what is known today as ceremonial magic, or the conjuring of spirits, who will actually evoke an archon to appear. Now there's two words, invoke and evoke. The pagans and Wiccans, they invoke. That's a way of asking nicely for a spirit to appear. Evoke means to order. So they will actually evoke or order an archon to appear. And they sometimes even evoke the head or lead archon of a planet. Other no, otherwise known as one of the seven planetary divinities. The sun, moon, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, as well as the eighth kingdom, the zodiac, which may be the entrance to the pleroma, all have their own divinity. Gods, goddesses, and demons may also be considered manifestations of astronomical phenomena such as lunar eclipses, planetary alignments, and interactions of planetary bodies with stars. The archons bury thought implants deep inside your unconscious, precisely because most people do not have the courage to delve into that land of mystery, utter blackness, and enlightenment. For there exists a back door in the unconscious. There exist ways to remove these implants. If you dared to read my book, 666, connection with Crowley, you will know that often these implants originate as karmic repercussions of our ancestors' deeds and actions. Our ancestors' deeds and actions may have opened a crack in our family's generational reality, allowing the archons to enter. Recall the force and power of the law of vibration. A distant ancestor may have plucked a cosmic string that has caused innumerable other strings of existence to sympathetically vibrate, ultimately culminating in all sorts of bewildering events happening in your life. How many of you have been to psychologists, psychiatrists, therapists, etc., and you still can't figure out what the fuck is wrong? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. No, no, I speak from experience. This is why it is so important to explore things like family constellations, DNA, and genealogical research into your family tree if you aspire to be a Gnostic. We must take psychic invasion 
seriously. I want to congratulate each of you who is exploring the concept of alien parasite invasion. And I also want to congratulate each of you who have their doubts about an alien invasion, but came here today anyway because you are an open-minded person. I did not come here to tell you that one story should be taken more literally than another, whatever mythologies you pursue. Predator alien parasites, Wittico, Don Juan's flyers, Clefoth, Nephilim, satanic demonic possession, memetics. The intrusion itself is real. This is an invasion. Whatever these beings are, they want to conceal from us our true divine potential and identity as sovereign spirits. Therefore, we must develop countermeasures. That is why I wrote my book, to give every human being a means to fight back. The leader of the authorities will be defeated by the children of light. How will we do this? By ceasing our preoccupation with appearance, with the artificial, with the inauthentic. And where must we start? With ourselves. We must start by truly loving and finding a way to contact the Gnostic God above God and all his, her emanations. We must start by being genuine. And we must start by throwing away our phony and inauthentic personas. As the Gospel of Thomas declaims, Stephen Davies' translation, quote, when you strip naked without shame and trample your clothing underfoot, just as little children do, then you will look at the son of the living one without being afraid, unquote. That is to say, naked awareness. If we come to realize that we partake in the co great consciousness of the mother, father, monad, that Schopenhauer described as, quote, <clears throat> that one eye of the world, which looks out from all knowing creatures, the eternal world eye, we become inaccessible to the archons. It's time for you, each of you, to develop a praxis, if you haven't already done so, in which you create ritual to make contact with the pleroma. It's time to truly live in the present moment. It's time to show and Miguel, you asked for a definition of love. It's time to show kindness, mercy, and compassion to one another. Then the archontic veil will fall from your eyes and you will see for the first time the realm of God. You will realize the truth of who you really are. Timeless awareness, infinite consciousness, mirrors of the divine. So I suggest you polish your mirrors of all dust and step with me into the realization of our unique divine nature, our oneness with Source. Thank you very much. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you. Thank you. I have some handouts here at the corner of the stage of books, movies, other things I recommend. Please feel free to take one.
You are all welcome to talk with me privately or grab me. Hello, hello. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to check in and uh, see when you were planning on doing the breath exercises, if it was going to be immediately following or some other time, but I'm excited for that. Okay, uh, well, whenever we have some free time, a uh, break in, in the day's procedures, just uh, I'll, I'll be around uh, and I won't disappear and just grab me and uh, we'll make it happen. Anything else? Lawrence, um, I was listening to you about the uh, articles. Mm. And, uh, and as you see, it's also, uh, uh, there's a similitude in between the archons and the ego are the same. What do you think about that? If the archons and the ego are the same, I, I would say that's a distinct possibility because uh, I have had personal gnosis in which I did disappear and I felt the light of God flowing through me. So it was not Lawrence Galeanne walking down the street. Uh, so, yeah, I think as much as we can, it's a difficult procedure, but our persona, our personality, in that sense of the ego, I would say that is an archontic creation. Uh, because as, as you know, uh, like Gurdjieff said, we have 50 eyes inside us. And Samael Anwar said something similar, that we have so many different uh, personal pronoun, I, inside us. We, we change constantly depending in what party we're at or at, if we're at work or whatever. Uh, so yeah, that would be my answer, just a quick answer. Thanks for your question. Uh, Lawrence, uh, yes. I want to say thank you very much. That was an excellent talk. Thank you, sir. Um, I was wondering if you could share with the, the Zoom audience, the Zoom audience, um, if you could share a quick breathing exercise, if there's one that would like take very uh, little time uh, for just everyone participating, that maybe they could get, get the value from that. Okay, uh, let me uh, see if I can take the microphone with me. Uh, yeah, I, oh, okay. Well, one of the words that the Sufis use for the divine, and this has been used by other cultures, is hi. Uh, they usually spell, uh, uh, transliterate it H-A-Y-Y, -Y, or they'll use who, H-U. So uh, we will work with, with these two words frequently. And now at first I want to say that some people say, oh, I know what you Sufis are doing. You're just hyperventilating. Uh, yes, yeah, some Sufis, see the early Sufis do hyperventilate, but we are taught very carefully how not to hyperventilate. So anyway, uh, an example for the Zoom audience, uh, we will start very, very slowly. This is a ceremony that builds and builds. And there are all sorts of circles. What you saw in that, that GIF before is just one order of Sufis. There are many different orders of Sufis, each with their own practices. But to the example, let's try hi. So we might start hi. Hey. And 
that's a very short version of a very long ritual. And we'll also use who, so who, who, It, it can get very, very intense. Just imagine several drummers playing. If um, I, I studied with an order from Istanbul, Turkey, so they had a whole orchestra uh, playing along with us, cymbals crashing. Uh, it's quite intense. And um, if I could just say quickly that... Um, that I had an experience that uh, Miguel was talking about, about voyaging out of the earth uh, during a Sufi ceremony. I, I didn't put that in my talk, but if you want to ask me about that, I'll, I'll tell you about it later, or just, uh, just ask, ask me to tell you the story. Uh, but uh, yes, I did, I did leave my body like that. Um, and uh, suddenly, I found myself on the roof of heaven. And I remember thinking to myself, I didn't know heaven had a roof. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, I'll tell you the rest of the story uh, if, you, if you're interested. Thank you very much, Zoom audience. Thank you, everyone here. See.